Hello, and welcome to Bite Sized Audio on YouTube. I'm Simon Stanhope, actor, audiobook narrator, and curator of this channel. On the channel, you can hear my narrations, more than a hundred to date and more to come, of classic short stories, mostly from the Victorian and Edwardian eras, including vintage ghost stories, detective stories, and other classic tales of mystery and suspense. To accompany the narrations, I've put a short profile of the authors in the video description, as well as some general background notes on the stories for those who'd like to know more. If you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe, like, share, leave a comment if you'd like to, and thank you for listening. The Eight Mile Lock by L. T. Mead and Robert Eustace It was in the August of 1889, when I was just arranging my annual holiday, that I received the following letter. I tore it open and read, Theodora Houseboat, Goring. Dear Mr. Bell, can you come down on Wednesday and stay with us for a week? The weather is glorious and the river looking its best. We are a gay party and there will be plenty of fun going on. Yours very truly, Helena Ridsdale. This was exactly what I wanted. I was fond of the river, and scarcely a summer passed that I did not spend at least a fortnight on the Thames. I could go for a week to the Ridsdales, and then start off on my own quiet holiday afterwards. I had known Lady Ridsdale since she was a girl, and I had no doubt my visit would prove a most enjoyable one. I replied immediately, accepting the invitation, and three days later arrived at Goring. As the well-cushioned little punt, which had been sent to bring me across the river, drew up alongside the Theodora, the Countess came down from the deck to welcome me. "'I am so glad you could come, Mr. Bell,' she said. "'I was afraid you might be away on some of your extraordinary campaigns against the supernatural. This is Mr. Rafe Viner.' He is also, like yourself, devoted to science. I am sure you will find many interests in common. A short, thick-set, wiry little man, dressed in white flannels, who had been lolling in a deck-chair, now came forward and shook hands with me. "'I know of you by reputation, Mr. Bell,' he said, "'and I have often hoped to have the pleasure of meeting you. I am sure we shall all be anxious to hear of some of your experiences.' We are such an excessively frivolous party that we can easily afford to be leavened with a little serious element. <laughs> but I don't mean to be serious in the least, I answered, laughing. I have come here to enjoy myself, and intend to be as frivolous as the rest of you. You will have an opportunity this evening, said the Countess. We are going to have a special band from town, and intend to have a moonlight dance on deck. Ah, here comes Charlie with the others, she added shading her eyes and looking down the stream. In a few moments a perfectly appointed little electric launch shot up, and my host, with the rest of the party, came on board. We shortly afterwards sat down to lunch, and a gayer and pleasanter set of people I have seldom met. In the afternoon we broke up into detachments, and Viner and I went for a long pull upstream. I found him a pleasant fellow— ready to talk at any length, not only about his own hobbies, but about the world at large. I discovered presently that he was a naval engineer, of no small attainments. When we returned to the houseboat, it was nearly time to prepare for dinner. Most of the ladies had already retired to their cabins. Lady Ridsdale was standing alone on deck. When she saw us both, she called to us to come to her side. "'This quite dazzles me,' she said, in a low, somewhat mysterious tone. "'And I must show it to you. I know you at least, Mr. Viner, will appreciate it.' As she spoke, she took a small leather case out of her pocket. It was ornamented with a monogram, and opened with a catch. She pressed the lid. It flew up, and I saw, resting on a velvet bed, a glittering circlet of enormous diamonds. The Countess lifted them out and slipped them over her slender wrist. "'They are some of the family diamonds,' 
she said, with excitement, and of great value. Charlie is having all the jewels reset for me, but the rest are not ready yet. He has just brought this down from town. Is it not superb? Did you ever see such beauties? The diamonds flashed on her white wrist. She looked up at me with eyes almost as bright. I love beautiful stones, she said, and I feel as if these were alive. Oh, do look at the rays of colour in them, as many as in the rainbow. I congratulated Lady Ridsdale on possessing such a splendid ornament, and then glanced at Viner, expecting him to say something. The expression on his face startled me, and I was destined to remember it by and by. The ruddy look had completely left it. His eyes were half starting from his head. He peered close, and suddenly, without the slightest warning, stretched out his hand and touched the diamonds as they glittered round Lady Ridsdale's wrist. She started back haughtily, then, recovering herself, took the bracelet off and put it into his hand. "'Charlie tells me,' she said, "'that this bracelet is worth from fifteen to twenty thousand pounds.' "'You must take care of it,' remarked Viner. "'Don't let your maid see it, for instance.' <laughs> "'Oh, nonsense!' laughed Lady Ridsdale. "'I would trust Louise as I would trust myself.' Soon afterwards we separated, and I went down to my little cabin to prepare for dinner. When we met in the dining saloon, I noticed that Lady Ridsdale was wearing the diamond bracelet. Almost immediately after dinner the band came on board, and the dancing began. We kept up our festivities until two o'clock, and more than once, as she flashed past me, I could not help noticing the glittering circlet round her wrist. I considered myself a fair judge of precious stones, but had never seen any diamonds for size and brilliancy to equal these. As Viner and I happened to stand apart from the others, he remarked upon them. "'It was imprudent of Ridsdale to bring those diamonds here,' he said. "'Suppose they are stolen?' <laughs> "'Scarcely likely,' I answered. "'There are no thieves on board.' He gave an impatient movement. "'As far as we know, there are not,' he said slowly. "'But one can never tell. "'The diamonds are of exceptional value, "'and it is not safe to expose ordinary folk to temptation. "'That small circlet means a fortune.' "'He sighed deeply, and when I spoke to him next, did not answer me. "'Not long afterwards our gay party dispersed.' and we retired to our respective cabins. I went to mine, and was quickly in bed. As a newly arrived guest, I was given a cabin on board, but several other members of the party were sleeping in tents on the shore. Viner and Lord Ridsdale were among the latter number. Whether it was the narrowness of my bunk, or the heat of the night, I cannot tell, but sleep I could not. Suddenly, through my open window— I heard voices from the shore nearby. I could identify the speakers by their tones. One was my host, Lord Ridsdale, the other Rafe Viner. Whatever formed the subject of discourse, it was evidently far from amicable. However much averse I might feel to the situation, I was compelled to be an unwilling eavesdropper, for the voices rose, and I caught the following words from Viner. "'Can you lend me five thousand pounds till the winter?' "'No, Viner, I have told you so before, and the reason too. "'It is your own fault, and you must take the consequences.' "'Do you mean that to be final?' asked Viner. "'Yes.' "'Very well. Then I shall look after myself. "'Thank God I have got brains if I have not money, "'and I shall not let the means interfere with the end.' "'You can go to the devil, for all I care,' was the angry answer. "'And, after what I know, I won't raise a finger to help you.' The speakers had evidently moved further off, for the last words I could not catch. But what little I heard by no means conduced to slumber. So Viner, for all his jovial and easy manner, was in a fix for money, and Ridsdale knew something about him, scarcely to his credit.' I kept thinking over this, 
and also recalling his words when he spoke of Lady Ridsdale's diamonds as representing a fortune. What did he mean by saying that he would not let the means interfere with the end? That brief sentence sounded very much like the outburst of a desperate man. I could not help heartily wishing that Lady Ridsdale's diamond circlet was back in London, and, just before I dropped to sleep, I made up my mind to speak to Ridsdale on the subject. Towards morning I did doze off, but I was awakened by hearing my name called, and, starting up, I saw Ridsdale standing by my side. His face looked queer and excited. "'Wake up, Bell! he cried. "'A terrible thing has happened!' "'What is it?' I asked. "'My wife's bracelet is stolen.' Like a flash I thought of Viner, and then, as quickly, I knew that I must be careful to give no voice to hastily formed suspicions. "'I won't be a moment dressing, and then I'll join you,' I said. Ridsdale nodded and left my cabin. In five minutes I was with him on deck. He then told me briefly what had happened. "'Helena most imprudently left the case on her dressing-table last night,' he said, "'and owing to the heat she kept the window open. "'Someone must have waded into the water in the dark and stolen it. "'Perhaps one of the band's men may have noticed the flashing of the diamonds on her wrist "'and returned to secure the bracelet. "'There's no saying. "'The only too palpable fact is that it is gone. "'It was valued at twenty thousand pounds.' "'Have you sent for the police?' I asked. "'Yes, and have also wired to Scotland Yard for one of their best detectives. Viner took the telegram for me, and was to call at the police station on his way back. He is nearly as much upset as I am. This is a terrible loss. I feel fit to kill myself for my folly in bringing that valuable bracelet on board a houseboat.' "'It was a little imprudent,' I answered. "'But you are sure to get it back.' "'I hope so,' he replied moodily. Just then the punt, with Viner and a couple of policemen on board, was seen rapidly approaching. Ridsdale went to meet them, and was soon in earnest conversation with the superintendent of police. The moment Viner leapt on board, he came to the part of the deck where I was standing. "'Ah, Bell,' he cried, "'what about my prognostications of last night?' "'They have been verified too soon,' I answered. I gave him a quick glance.' His eyes looked straight into mine. "'Have you any theory to account for the theft?' I asked. "'Yes, a very simple one. Owing to the heat of the evening, the Countess slept with her window open. It was an easy matter to wade through the water, introduce a hand through the open window, and purloin the diamonds.' "'Without being seen by any occupants of the tents?' I queried. "'Certainly,' he answered, speaking slowly and with thought. "'Then you believe the thief came from without?' "'I do. "'What about your warning to Lady Ridsdale yesterday evening, not to trust her maid?' "'I saw his eyes flash. "'It was the briefest of summer lightning that played in their depths. "'I knew that he longed to adopt the suggestion that I had on purpose thrown out, but dared not.' That one look was enough for me. I had guessed his secret. Before he could reply to my last remark, Lord Ridsdale came up. "'What is to be done?' he said. "'The police superintendent insists on our all, without respect of persons, being searched.' "'There is nothing in that,' I said. "'It is the usual thing. I will be the first to submit to the examination.' The police went through their work thoroughly, and, of course, came across neither clue nor diamonds. We presently sat down to breakfast, but I don't think we any of us had much appetite. Lady Ridsdale's eyes were red with crying, and I could see that the loss had shaken both her nerve and fortitude. It was more or less of a relief when the post came in. Amongst the letters I found a telegram for myself— I knew what it meant before I opened it. It was from a man in a distant part of the country whom I had promised to assist in a matter of grave importance. 
I saw that it was necessary for me to return to town without delay. I was very loath to leave my host and hostess in their present dilemma, but there was no help for it, and soon after breakfast I took my leave. Ridsdale promised to write me if there was any news of the diamonds, and soon the circumstance passed more or less into the background of my brain, owing to the intense interest of the other matter which I had taken up. My work in the north was over, and I had returned to town, when I received a letter from Ridsdale. "'We are in a state of despair,' he wrote. "'We have had two detectives on board, and the police have moved heaven and earth to try and discover the bracelet. All in vain. Not the slightest clue has been forthcoming. No one has worked harder for us than Viner. He has a small place of his own further down the river, and comes up to see us almost daily.' He has made all sorts of suggestions for the recovery of the diamonds, but hitherto they have led to nothing. In short, our one hope now turns upon you, Bell. You have done as difficult things as this before. Will you come and see us, and give us the benefit of your advice? If any man can solve this mystery, you are the person. I wrote immediately to say that I would return to the Theodora on the following evening and, for the remainder of that day, tried, to the best of my ability, to think out this most difficult problem. I felt morally certain that I could put my hand on the thief, but I had no real clue to work upon, nothing beyond a nameless suspicion. Strange as it may seem, I was moved by sentiment. I had spent some pleasant hours in Vinus society. I had enjoyed his conversation. I had liked the man for himself— he had abilities above the average, of that I was certain. If he were proved guilty, I did not want to be the one to bring his crime home to him. So uncomfortable were my feelings, that at last I made up my mind to take a somewhat bold step. This was neither more nor less than to go to see Viner himself, before visiting the houseboat. What I was to do and say, when I got to him, I was obliged to leave altogether to chance— but I had a feeling, almost amounting to a certainty, that by means of this visit I should ultimately return the bracelet to my friends the Ridsdales. The next afternoon I found myself rowing slowly down the river, thinking what the issue of my visit to Viner would be. It happened to be a perfect evening. The sun had just set. The long stretch of river stretched away to the distant bend, where, through the gathering twilight, I could just see the white gates of the eight-mile lock. Raising my voice, I sang out, in a long-drawn, sonorous monotone, the familiar cry of, "'Lock! Lock! Lock!' and, bending to the skulls, sent my little skiff flying downstream. The sturdy figure of old James Pegg, the lock-keeper, whom I had known for many years, instantly appeared on the bridge. One of the great gates slowly swung open, and, shipping my skulls, I shot in, and called out a cheery good evening to my old friend. "'Mr. Bell!' exclaimed the old fellow, hurrying along the edge of the lock. "'Well, I never! I did not see it was you at first, and yet I ought to have known that long, swinging stroke of yours. You were the last person I expected to see. I was half afraid it might be someone else.' "'although I don't know that I was expecting anyone in particular. E "'Excuse me, sir, but was it you called out Lock just now?' <laughs> well, "'Of course it was,' I answered, laughing. "'I'm in the juice of a hurry tonight, Jimmy, "'as I want to get on to Wooten before dark. "'Look sharp, will you, and let me down.' <laughs> "'All right, sir, but you did frighten me just now. "'I wish you hadn't called out like that.' As I glanced up at him, I was surprised to see that his usually ruddy, round face was as white as a sheet, and he was breathing quickly. "'Why, what on earth is the matter, Jimmy?' I cried. "'How can I frighten you?' "'Oh, oh, it's nothing, sir. I suppose I'm an old fool,' he faltered, smiling. "'I don't know what's the matter with me, sir. I'm all of a tremble. The fact is, something happened here last night—' and I don't seem to have got over it. You know, I am all by myself here now, sir. 
and a lonely place it is. "'Something happened,' I said. "'Not an accident, I hope.' Oh, "'No, sir, no accident that I know of. And yet I have been half expecting one to occur all day. And I have been that weak I could hardly wind up the sluices. I am getting old now, and I am not the man I was. But I am right glad to see you, Mr. Bell, that I am.' He kept pausing as he spoke, and now and then glanced up the river, as if expecting to see a boat coming round the bend every moment. I was much puzzled by his extraordinary manner. I knew him to be a steady man, and one whose services were much valued by the Conservancy, but it needed only a glance now to show that there was something very much amiss with him. The darkness was increasing every moment— and, being anxious to get on as soon as possible, I was just going to tell him again to hurry up with the sluices, when he bent down close to me and said, "'Would you mind stepping out for a moment, sir, if you can spare the time? I wish to speak to you, sir. I'd be most grateful if you would wait a minute or two. "'Certainly, Jimmy,' I answered, hauling myself to the side with the boat-hook and getting out. "'Is there anything I can do for you?' "'I am afraid you are not well. "'I never saw you like this before.' "'No, sir, and I never felt like it before, that I can remember. "'Something happened here last night that has taken all the nerve out of me, "'and I want to tell you what it was. "'I know you are so clever, Mr. Bell, "'and I have heard about your doings up at Wallinghurst last autumn, "'when you cleared up the manor-house ghost and got old Monkford six months.' "'Well, fire away,' I said, filling my pipe, and wondering what was coming. "'It is this way, sir,' he began. "'Last night, after I had had my supper, I thought I'd like a stroll and a quiet smoke along the towing path before turning in. I did not expect any more boats, as it was getting on for ten o'clock. I walked about three-quarters of a mile, and was just going to turn round, when I saw a light.' down on the surface of the water, in midstream. It was pretty dark, for the moon was not up yet, and there was a thick white mist rising from the water. I thought it must be someone in a canoe at first, so I waited a bit and watched. Then it suddenly disappeared, and the next instant I saw it again, about a hundred yards or so higher up the stream, but only for a second, and then it went out. It fairly puzzled me to know what it could be, as I had never seen anything like it before. I felt sure it wasn't any sort of craft, but I had heard of strange lights being seen at times on the water. What they call jack-o'-lanterns, I believe, sir. I reckoned it might be one of them. But I thought I'd get back to the lock, so that, if it was a canoe, I could let it through. However, nothing came of it— and I waited and watched and worried all the evening about it, but couldn't come to any sort of idea. So I went to bed. Well, about one o'clock this morning, I suddenly woke up and thought I could hear someone a long way off calling exactly as you did just now. Lock! 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 But it sounded ever so far away. "'It's some of those theatre people coming back to the Will o' the Wisp house boat, I said to myself, "'and I'm not going to turn out for them. "'The lock was full at the time, so I thought I would just let them work it for themselves. "'I waited a bit, expecting to hear them every minute come up, singing and swearing as they do, "'but they never came, and I was just dropping off when I heard the call again. "'It was not an ordinary sort of voice,' but a long, wailing cry, just as if someone was in trouble or drowning. Hi! Hi! Lock! Lock! it went. I got up then and went out. The moon was up now, and quite bright, and the mist had cleared off, so I went to the bridge on the upper gates and looked upstream. This is where I was standing, sir, just as we are standing now. I could see right up to the bend, and there was not the sign of a boat. I stood, straining my eyes, expecting to see a boat come round every moment, when I heard the cry again, and this time 
it sounded not fifty yards upstream. I could not make it out at all, so I shouted out as loud as I could, "'Who are you? What's the matter?' But there was no answer, and then suddenly, the next instant, close below me, from inside the lock this time, just here, came a shout, piercing, shrill and loud, "'Open the lock! Quick! Quick! Open the lock!' Oh, I tell you, sir, my heart seemed to stand dead still, and I nearly fell back over the bridge. I wheeled round sharp, but there was nothing in the lock, that I'll swear to my dying day, for I could see all over it, and nothing could have got in there without passing me. The moon was quite bright, and I could see all round it. Without knowing what I was doing, I rushed down like mad to the lower gates, and began to wind up one of the sluices, and then I stood there and waited, but nothing came. As the lock emptied, I looked down, but there was no sign of anything anywhere, so I let down the sluice without opening the gates, and then filled up the lock again. I stood by the post, hardly daring to move, when, about half-past five, thank God, I heard the whistle of a tug, and after seeing her through, it was broad daylight— "'Well, that's the whole story, sir. "'And how I'm going to live through the night again, I don't know. "'It was a spirit, if ever there was one in the world. "'It's a warning to me, sir. "'And what's going to happen, I don't know.' "'Well, Jimmy,' I answered, "'it certainly is a most extraordinary story. "'And if I didn't know you as well as I do, "'I should say you had taken something more than a smoke "'before you turned in last night.' "'I never touch a drop, sir, except when I go into Farley and have a glass of beer, "'but I have not been there for more than a week now.' "'I confess that Jimmy's story had left a most unpleasant impression on me. "'I had little doubt that the whole thing was some strange, subjective hallucination. "'But for a weird and ghostly experience, it certainly beat most of the tales I had ever heard. "'I thought for a moment. It was now quite dark.' and I felt little inclined to go on to Wooten. My keenest interests were awakened. "'Look here,' I said. "'What do you say if I stay here to-night? Can you give me a shake-down of any sort?' "'That I will, sir, and right gladly, and thank God, if you will but stay with me. If I was alone here again, and heard that voice, I believe it would kill me.' "'I'll tie up your boat outside, and bring your things in, and then we'll have supper. Oh, "'I'll feel a new man with you staying here, sir.' "'In a few minutes we were both inside old Jimmy's cosy quarters. "'His whole bearing seemed to have changed suddenly, and he ran about with alacrity, "'getting supper ready, and seeming quite like himself again. "'During the whole evening he kept harping at intervals on the subject of the mysterious voice— but we heard no sound whatever, and I felt more and more certain that the whole thing was due to hallucination on the part of the old man. At eleven o'clock a skiff came up through the lock, and almost immediately afterwards I bade Jimmy good night, and went into the little room he had prepared for me. I went quickly to bed, and, tired after my long pull, despite the originality of the situation, fell fast asleep. Suddenly I awoke. Someone was bending over me and calling me by my name. I leapt up, and, not realising where I was for the moment, but with a sort of dim idea that I was engaged in some exposure, instinctively seized the man roughly by the throat. In a moment I remembered everything, and quickly released my grip of poor old Jimmy, who was gurgling and gasping with horror. I burst out laughing at my mistake, and begged his pardon for treating him so roughly. "'It, it is all right, sir,' he panted. "'I hope I didn't frighten you, but I have heard it again, not five minutes ago.' "'The deuce you have,' I said, striking a match and looking at my watch. It was nearly two o'clock, and before the minute was up, I heard distinctly a cry— as if from some great distance, of lock, lock, lock. 
and then all was silence again. "'Did you hear it, sir?' whispered the old man, clutching me by the arm with a trembling hand. "'Yes, I heard it,' I said. "'Don't you be frightened, Jimmy. Just wait till I get my clothes on. I'm going to see this thing through.' "'Be careful, sir. For God's sake, be careful,' he whispered. "'All right,' I said, slipping on some things. "'Just get me a good strong boat-hook, and don't make too much noise. "'If this mystery is flesh and blood, I'll get to the bottom of it somehow. "'You stay here, and if I call, come out.' "'I took the thick short boat-hook which he had brought me, "'and, softly unlatching the door, went out. "'The moon was now riding high overhead,' and casting black, fantastic shadows across the little white cottage. All my senses were on the keenest alert. My ears were pricked up for the slightest sound. I crept softly to the bridge on the upper gate, which was open. I looked upstream, and thought I could see some little ripples on the surface of the water, as if a swift boat had just passed down, but there was no sign of any craft whatever to be seen. It was intensely still, and no sound broke the silence, save the intermittent croaking of some bullfrogs in the dark shadows of the pollards on the further bank. Behind me could also be heard the gurgling twinkle of the overflow through the chinks of the lower gate. I stood quite still, gripping the boat-hook in my hand, and looking right and left, straining my eyes for the slightest movement of anything around, when suddenly, close below me from the water, inside the lock, came a loud cry. "'Open the lock! For God's sake, open the lock!' I started back, feeling my hair rise and stiffen. The sound echoed and reverberated through the silent night, and then died away. But before it had done so, I had sprung to the great beam and closed the upper gate— as I did so, I caught sight of the old man trembling and shaking at the door of the cottage. I called to him to go and watch the upper gate, and, racing down to the lower ones, wound up one of the sluices with a few pulls, so as to let out the water with as little escape room as possible. I knew by this means, if there were any creature of tangible form in the water, we must find it when the lock was emptied, as its escape was cut off. Each of the following minutes seemed stretched into a lifetime, as, with eyes riveted on the dark water in the lock, I watched its gradual descent. I hardly dared to think of what I expected to see rise to the surface any moment. Would the lock never empty? Down, down sank the level, and still I saw nothing— a long, misshapen arm of black cloud was slowly stretching itself across the moon. <gasps> Hark! There was something moving about, down in the well of darkness below me. And as I stood and watched, I saw that the water was uncovering a long, black mass, and that something ran slowly out of the water and began to clamber up the slimy, slippery beams— <gasps> What in the name of heaven could it be? By the uncertain light I could only see its dim outline. It seemed to have an enormous bulbous head and dripping, glistening body. The sound of a rapid patter up the towpath told me that the old man had seen it and was running for his life. I rushed down to where the thing was, and, as its great head appeared over the edge, with all my force, struck it a terrific blow with the boat-hook. The weapon flew into splinters in my hand, and the next moment the creature had leapt up beside me and dashed me to the ground with almost superhuman force. I was up and on to it again in a second, and, as I caught and closed with it, saw that I had at least to deal with a human being, and that what he lacked in stature he more than made up for in strength. The struggle that ensued was desperate and furious. The covering to his head that had splintered the boat-hook was, I saw, a sort of helmet, 
completely protecting the head from any blow, and the body was cased in a slippery, closely fitting garment that kept eluding my grasp. To and fro we swayed and wrestled, and for a moment I thought I had met my match, till, suddenly freeing my right arm, I got in a smashing blow in the region of the heart. The creature uttered a cry of pain and fell headlong to the ground. Old Jimmy Pegg had hurried back as soon as he heard our struggles, and knew that he was not dealing with a being of another world. He ran up eagerly to me. "'Here's your ghost, you old coward,' I panted. "'He has got the hardest bone and muscle I ever felt in a ghost yet. I am not used to fighting men in helmets, and he is as slippery as an eel, but I hope to goodness I have not done more than knock the wind out of him. He is a specimen I should rather like to take alive. Catch hold of his feet, and we'll get him inside, and see who he is.' Between us we carried the prostrate figure inside the cottage, and laid him down like a log on the floor. He never moved nor uttered a sound, and I was afraid at first that I had finished him for good and all. I next knelt down and proceeded to unfasten the helmet, which, from its appearance, was something like the kind used by divers, while the old man brought the lantern close to his face. At the first glance I knew in an instant that I had seen the face before, and the next second recognised, to my utter astonishment and horror, that it belonged to Rafe Viner. For the moment I was completely dumbfounded, and gazed at the man without speaking. It was obvious that he had only fainted from the blow, for I could see that he was breathing, and in a few minutes he opened his eyes— and fixed them on me with a dull and vacant stare. Then he seemed to recall the situation, though he evidently did not recognise me. "'Let me go!' he cried, making an effort to rise. "'My God! You have killed me!' He pressed his hand to his side, and fell back again. His face was contorted, as if in great pain. There was obviously only one thing to be done— and that was to send for medical assistance at once. It was clear that the man was badly injured, but to what extent I could not determine. It was impossible to extract the slightest further communication from him. He lay quite still, groaning from time to time. I told Jimmy to go off at once to Farley and bring the doctor. I scribbled a few directions on a piece of paper. The old man hurried out of the cottage— but in less than a minute he was back again, in great excitement. "'Look here, sir, what I have just picked up,' he said. "'It's something he has dropped, I reckon.' As Jimmy spoke, he held out a square leather case. There was a monogram on it. I took it in my hand and pressed the lid. It flew open, and inside, resting on its velvet bed, lay the glittering circlet of diamonds.' I held Lady Ridsdale's lost bracelet in my hand. All my suspicions were confirmed. Viner was the thief. Without saying a word, I shut the box and dispatched the old man at once for the doctor, bidding him go as fast as he could. Then I sat down by the prostrate man and waited. I knew that Jimmy could not be back for at least two hours— The grey dawn was beginning to steal in through the little latticed window when Viner moved, opened his eyes, and looked at me. He started as his eyes fell on the case. "'You are Mr. Bell,' he said slowly. "'Ridsdale told me that you were coming to the Theodora on purpose to discover the mystery of the lost diamonds.' You didn't know that I should give you an opportunity of discovering the truth even before you arrived at the houseboat. Bend down close to me. You have injured me. I may not recover. Hear what I have to say. I bent over him, prepared to listen to his words, which came out slowly. I am a forger and a desperate man. Three weeks ago I forged one of Ridsdale's checks, and lessened my friend's balance to the tune of five thousand pounds. 
He and his wife were old friends of mine, but I wanted the money desperately, and was impervious to sentiment or anything else. On that first day when you met me, although I seemed cheery enough, I was fit to kill myself. I had hoped to be able to restore the stolen money long before Ridsdale was likely to miss it, but this hope had failed. I saw no loophole of escape, and the day of reckoning could not be far off. What devil prompted Ridsdale to bring those diamonds on board, heaven only knows. The moment I saw them they fascinated me, and I knew I should have a try for them. All during that evening's festivity I could think of nothing else. I made up my mind to secure them by hook or by crook. Before we retired for the night, however, I thought I would give Ridsdale a chance. I asked him if he would lend me the exact sum— I had already stolen from him five thousand pounds, but he had heard rumours to my discredit, and refused point-blank. I hated him for it. I went into my tent under the pretence of lying down, but in reality to concoct, and, if possible, carry out my plot. I waited until the quietest hour before dawn. Then I slipped out of my tent, waded into the water, "'approached the open window of the Countess's cabin, "'thrust in my hand, took out the case, "'and, going down the river about a quarter of a mile, "'threw the diamonds into the middle of the stream. "'I marked well the place where they sank. "'I then returned to my tent and went to bed. "'You know what occurred the following morning. "'I neither feared Ridsdale nor his wife. "'But you, Bell gave me a considerable amount of uneasiness. I felt certain that in an evil moment on the night before I had given you a clue. To a man of your ability the slightest clue was all sufficient. I felt that I must take the bull by the horns, and find out whether you suspected me or not. I talked to you, and guessed by the tone of your remarks that you had your suspicions— my relief was immense when that telegram arrived which hurried you away from the Theodora. On the following day I returned to my own little place on the banks of the river four miles below this lock. I knew it was necessary for me to remain quiet for a time, but all the same my plans were clearly made, and I only waited until the first excitement of the loss had subsided and the police and detectives were off their guard. In the meantime I went to see Ridsdale almost daily, and suggested many expedients for securing the thief and getting hold of the right clue. If he ever suspected me, which I don't for a moment suppose, I certainly put him off the scent. My intention was to take the diamonds out of the country, sell them for all that I could get, then return the five thousand pounds which I had stolen from his bank, and leave England for ever. As a forger I should be followed to the world's end, but as the possessor of stolen diamonds I felt myself practically safe. My scheme was too cleverly worked out to give the ordinary detective a chance of discovering me. Two days ago I had a letter from Ridsdale, in which he told me that he intended to put the matter into your hands. Now, this was by no means to my mind, for you, Bell— happened to be the one man in the world whom I really dreaded. I saw that I must no longer lose time. Under my little boathouse I had a small submarine boat which I had lately finished, more as a hobby than anything else. I had begun it years ago, in my odd moments, on a model I had seen of a torpedo used in the American war. My boat is now in the lock outside— and you will see for yourself what ingenuity was needed to construct such a thing. On the night before the one which has just passed, I got it ready, and as soon as it was dark, started off in it to recover the diamonds. I got through the lock easily by going in under the water with a barge, but when I reached the spot where I had sunk the diamonds, found to my dismay that my electric light would not work— there was no help for it. I could not find the bracelet without the aid of the light, 
and was bound to return home to repair the lamp. This delay was fraught with danger, but there was no help for it. My difficulty now was to get back through the lock, for though I waited for quite three hours, no boats came along. I saw the upper gates were open, but how to get through the lower ones I could not conceive. I felt sure that my only chance was to frighten the lock-keeper, and get him to open the sluices, for I knew I could pass through them unobserved if they were open, as I had done once before. In my diver's helmet was a thick glass face-piece. This had an opening, closed by a cap, which could be unscrewed, and through which I could breathe when above water, and also through which my voice would come, causing a peculiar hollowness, which I guessed would have a very startling effect, especially as I myself would be quite invisible. I got into the lock and shouted to Peg. I succeeded in frightening him. He hurried to do what I ordered. He wound up the lower sluice. I shot through under water, and so got back unseen. All yesterday I hesitated about trying the experiment again. The risk was so great, but I knew that Ridsdale was certain to see his bank-book soon, that my forgery was in imminent danger of being discovered. Also that you, Bell, were coming upon the scene. Yes, at any risk I must now go on. I repaired my light, and again last night passed through the lock on my way up by simply waiting for another boat. As a matter of fact, I passed up through this lock under a skiff about eleven o'clock. My light was now all right. I found the diamond case easily, and turned to pass down the stream by the same method as before. If you had not been here, I should have succeeded, and should have been safe. But now it is all up. He paused, and his breath came quickly. "'I doubt if I shall recover,' he said in a feeble voice. "'I hope you will,' I replied. "'And hark, I think I hear the doctor's steps.' I was right. For a moment or two later, old Jimmy Pegg and Dr. Simmons entered the cottage. While the doctor was examining the patient and talking to him, I went out with Jimmy to have a look at the submarine boat.' By fixing a rope round it, we managed to haul it up, and then proceeded to examine it. It certainly was the most wonderful piece of ingenious engineering I had ever seen. The boat was in the shape of an enormous cigar, and was made of aluminium. It was seven feet long, and had a circular beam of sixteen inches. At the pointed end, close to where the occupant's feet would be, was an air chamber, capable of being filled or emptied at will by means of a compressed air cylinder, enabling the man to rise or sink whenever he wished to. Inside, the boat was lined with flat chambers of compressed air for breathing purposes, which were governed by a valve. It was also provided with a small accumulator and electric motor, which drove the tiny propeller astern. The helmet which the man wore fitted around the opening at the head-end. After examining the boat, it was easy to see how Viner had escaped through the lock the night before I arrived, as this submarine wonder of ingenuity would be able to shoot through the sluice-gate under water when the sluice was raised to empty the lock. After exchanging a few remarks with Jimmy, I returned to the cottage to learn the doctor's verdict. It was grave, but not despairing. The patient could not be moved for a day or two. He was, in Dr. Simmons's opinion, suffering more from shock than anything else. If he remained perfectly quiet, he would in all probability recover. If he were disturbed, the consequences might be serious. An hour afterwards I found myself on my way upstream, sculling as fast as I could in the direction of the Theodora. I arrived there at an early hour, and put the case which contained the diamonds into Lady Ridsdale's hands. I shall never forget the astonishment of Ridsdale and his wife when I told my strange tale. The Countess burst into tears, and Ridsdale was terribly agitated. 
I have known Viner from a boy, and so has my wife, he exclaimed. Of course, this proves him to be an unmitigated scoundrel, but I cannot be the one to bring him to justice. Oh, no, Charlie, whatever happens, we must forgive him, said Lady Ridsdale, looking up with a white face. I had nothing to say to this. It was not my affair. Unwittingly, I had been the means of restoring to the Ridsdales their lost bracelet. They must act as they thought well with regard to the thief. As a matter of fact, Viner did escape the full penalty of his crime. Having got back the diamonds, Lord Ridsdale would not prosecute. On the contrary, he helped the broken-down man to leave the country. From the view of pure justice, he was, of course, wrong. But I could not help being glad. As an example of what a desperate man will do, I think it would be difficult to beat Viner's story. The originality and magnitude of the conception, the daring which enabled the man, single-handed, to do his own dredging in a submarine boat in one of the reaches of the Thames, have seldom been equalled. As I thought over the whole scheme, my only regret was that such ability should not have been devoted to nobler ends. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook, read by me, Simon Stanhope. If you'd like to help me to keep producing new content, you can find links in the video description to my Patreon page, or to buy me a coffee. Another way to support me is through my Bandcamp page, bitesizedaudio.bandcamp.com, where you can hear my narrations of many more classic short stories, and you can also purchase and download them to keep. This recording is copyright Bite-Sized Audio 2023. Thank you for listening.